one of the things that, that men want, and over the weekend I actually spoke for Pastor Cash at their men's conference, and the number one thing that came out was that men really look now, what have I said that men really want? They want to be what? They want to be respected. In there, in Guatemala, it was they want to be admired. I said, same thing, only Spanish. You know, it's really kind of the same thing. And so what's really important for us is that we need to understand that men's, you know, somebody said, well, you know, I really want to know what your love language is. If you want to know what your husband's love language is, is that it's not chocolate cake. <laughs> your husband's love language is not, you know, tacos, <laughs> chiladas. It's not any of those things. Really what it is, is it's actually to be respected. What I want to talk to you about this morning is how to be a long distance dad. That doesn't mean a dad that's far away. That means a dad that's in it for the long distance of it all. So as I've walked through life, I've seen people go through grueling preparations to compete in their chosen fields. They prayed, they fasted, they disciplined themselves, they went without food, sleep, money, and they actually even went without life. All for the goal which they so desperately desired. But of all the races one could prepare for, there is none more rewarding to all of humanity than training to be a father. If one would father, he must understand that it's a marathon and it's not a sprint. All the dads that were up here today, I really appreciated what you know Lloyd and Mark and Lavelle said about being a dad. It's a long haul. It's that there will always be your babies, no matter what. You always have to talk to them like they are. So it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Pope John Paul the twenty-third said this, it's easier for a father to have children than for children to have a real father. Here's some startling statistics. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes, the CDC said. 80% of rapists motivated their motivation is with displaced anger that comes from a fatherless home. All of these things have references. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth sitting in prisons grew up in a fatherless home. And nearly two out of every five children in America do not live with their fathers. So what does all of this mean? It has a meaning to us. Children from fatherless homes are 4.6 times more likely to commit suicide. They're 6.6 times more likely to become teenager, teenage mothers, and only if they're girls, of course. 24.3 times more likely to run away, 15.3 times more likely to have behavioral disorder, 6.3 times more likely to be in a state-operated institution, 10.8 10 time, 10 times more likely to commit rape, 6.6 .6 times more likely to drop out of school, and 15.3 times more likely to end up in prison while they're a teenager. All from a fatherless home. And here's what some others have said about being a father, so you know. Confucius said, the father who does not teach his son his duties 
is equally guilty with the son who neglects them. Clarence Kellen said, my father didn't tell me how to live. He lived and let me watch him do it. Robert Orban said, life was a lot simpler when what we honored was father and mother rather than all the major credit cards. I put that in there because I thought it was cute. <laughs> Charles Wadsworth said this, by the time a man realizes that maybe his father was right, he usually has a son who thinks he's wrong. <laughs> Isn't that true? Theodore Hesburgh said this, the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. The greatest impression a child will ever have of their father arrives the moment they observe how he treats the one who bore them. You need to finish what you start. You started in that relationship. You started loving her. Now love her. You know, the Bible is an interesting thing. When it tells a man to love his wife like Christ loved the church, he's not talking to him about having good feelings. He talks to her about having good feelings because of her attitudes. But he doesn't talk to him about having good feelings. He talks to him about his commitments. He talks to you about your commitment. He talks to your wife about her attitude. But he said, now you love her. And you care for her. And you look after her. And when you do, that's when she'll know that she's loved. In 2 Timothy 4, verse number 7 says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. He said, I've kept the faith. I've finished this race. So dads, here's some help to run in that race. Here's some help to do that. Number one, a dad that's in it for the long haul knows that you must never put off until tomorrow what you can do today. If you're in it for the long haul, teach your kids, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. That way you won't have any science projects that you're actually doing and feeling guilty because you stayed up till 2 o'clock the night before and did your, ch your child's science project. Teach them. Now, you have to remember, it's an interesting thing. We have lived in a society of options. Gentlemen, you have given your family too many options. When Joshua was at the end of his life, here it was that Moses led the 2 million Jews out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He did all of those things. And when he did that, when he did that, he went home. And when he went home to be with the Lord, Joshua took over. But interestingly enough, Joshua came to the end of his life and said these words. He said, if it is too hard for you to serve the Lord, this you need to choose. But I want to tell you, as for me and my house, we're going to do what? He said, me and my house. He said, I'm deciding for my house. You decide for your house. We're going to serve the Lord. This is what we're doing. This is what we do as a family. This is how we live. We're going to serve the Lord. The tail is not wagging our dog. Well, you know, we got baseball. Yeah. Yeah. You take a kid that's no good at baseball, you put him in baseball, you take him out of church when he could be a good Christian, and you take him out of church, and now the, now the country suffers. Kid don't even want to play baseball. You make him play baseball because, you know, you don't want him playing with dolls, so you make him play baseball. So teach them that they must never put off until tomorrow what they can do today. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 27, the Bible says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. When it's in your power to help them. You do it right away. When it's in your power to help them. He said, because if you can help your neighbor now, don't say come back tomorrow and then I'll do it. 
You do it now. Everyone say, do it now. Okay, you do it now. As a father, you do it now. As a father, your, your life must never be defined by procrastination. You don't put things off. You live as an example in front of the rest of your family. And then number two is that a dad that will be there forever knows that character is the sail that charts the course of destiny. You work on their character. It's on their character. You don't work on... It, it, it's an interesting thing because it, it's spoken to me more all the time. But how many of you have ever heard the term, you know, they're spoiled? Have you ever heard that term? They're spoiled? Well, let me just kind of speak to that for just a second. They're spoiled. They're spoiled actually just means... It doesn't mean that this child is horrible, it means that the person who did it to them is horrible. They spoiled the milk. Why? They left it on the counter. They spoiled the food. Why? They left it out overnight and then tried to serve it to someone. They spoiled it. As a father... Not spoiling your children has to do with you not teaching them the things that God has told you that they must learn. Proverbs chapter 11 verse number 3 says that the integrity of the righteous shall guide them. But the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. And then John 8, 29, Jesus said this, and this is, must also be true. He said, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. He said, for I always do, always do those things that please him. It's an amazing thing. Number three. Number three. A dad that's committed to his children's future knows that a child who does what is right is proof that wisdom has been planted in the right soil. A dad that's committed to his children's future. Are you committed to your children's future? How many of you wives would love for their, your children's fathers to be committed to their future? You want your husband to be committed to the children's futures. It's true, isn't it? More than anything else as a mother, you want that father to be able to father those kids. You father those children. Because even a great mother cannot be a horrible father. So a dad that is committed to his children's future, because a child who does what is right is proof that wisdom has been planted in the right soil. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 11, the Bible says, even a child is known by his actions, by whether his conduct is pure and right. Fathers, teach your children that the righteous should choose their friends carefully because the way of the wicked will lead them astray. Teach your children, gentlemen, that he that walks with wise people will become wise. Introduce your children to your friends. When it, comes into, when it comes into life, spend your time actually linking and bringing a bond between the people that you know with your children. Because then they will become friends of the people that are friends of yours, and then you can Facebook creep them without going to Facebook. <laughs> How many of you know what Facebook creeping is? How many of you ever felt like you were being creeped by somebody? How many of you know a creep? Just right. <laughs> you, know, you know a creep? I know a creep or two. I know some and I know some people that are creepy. Just creepy. So teach him that he that walks with wise people will become wise. I'm so grateful that 
my closest of friends are friends of my son. It's important. Give them their friendships. Don't give them a whole bunch of time to spend listening to the wrong people. Let them listen to right people in life. Number four, a dad that is willing to risk his children's anger to secure their future teaches this. He said, my son, you cannot fail without your permission. If you're willing to risk their anger, you can't fail without your permission. But remember, you cannot succeed without your involvement. I need your involvement to succeed. If you're going to succeed in life, be involved. If you fail in life, it will be because you gave permission for failure to come. In Joshua 24, 15, once again, Joshua said, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to do what? Serve the Lord. Gentlemen, say it. Serve the Lord. Say it again. Serve the Lord. Say it again. Serve the Lord. Say it like I want to hear it. Because you, you and your family are going to serve the Lord. That's what we do. We serve God. We serve the Word of God. We're interested in what God's Word has to say. We want to find out what He thinks. We don't want an opinion from anybody. I don't want anyone's opinion over stuff. I appreciate, I appreciate godly advice, but I don't want someone's opinion. Opinions are like onions. As soon as you get one layer off it, there's always another one. People's opinions change from day to day, but God's word never changes. So you are going to serve God. We're going to serve God. We're going to find out what God says. We're going to do what God says. That's what we're going to do. We're not doing all this other stuff. I'm not trying to make my kids my friends. I am attempting to live as a leader before them. And then, of course, number five. A dad that is serious about his role as a father teaches his children that God never consults your past to determine your future. Stuff happens. Life can be difficult. Things can be challenging. But yet even with all of that, God is always loving and always forgiving, always merciful. You find throughout the scriptures, you find how the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, no matter what. No matter what your children face, no matter what has gone on, no matter what has happened, don't worry about it. You tell them that God will forgive them, and God will care for them, and they'll be okay. So God never consults your past to determine your future. Psalm 103, verse number 12, tell them that as far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed your transgressions from you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17, the Bible tells us this. He said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, tell your children. Teach your children, gentlemen, that they're a new creature. And old things are passed away and all things have become new. You can accept someone without being accepting of what has happened. You can love someone without loving what has occurred. You can encourage someone even during the darkest moments of discouragement. And that's not by telling them that it's okay because it's not okay. As a matter of fact, very little is okay.
In the church, we call them prophets. They're the people that come in and they say something bad. They're not necessarily the people that come in and say something good. The people that come in and say something good, what you can do is you can actually go and put that on the shelf and maybe enjoy it. But the ones that come in and they say something bad, the ones that come in and say that there's persecution that is coming upon you, and this is how you get free. Live as a prophet before your children. A real prophet. Show them and tell them how difficult that life can be. But yet at the same time, God will always love you. He will always forgive you. He will always care for you in every way. Being a long distance dad, that's really what it's all about. Today we honor you as fathers. But like Pope John Paul said, that it is easier for a man to have children than it is for those children to have a father. Be a father. Your wives need it. Women need men to become fathers. That doesn't mean that you belch and sit on the couch and drink beer. <laughs> and don't forget your pizza, you know. That doesn't mean that. What it means is, is that you're the one that can be looked up to. Because if your greatest desire is to be respected and admired, then do those things with your family that bring respect and admiration. Don't expect a harvest off of a seed that you've never sown. You sow the right seeds. You'll get the right results. Gentlemen, please stand. I want to pray for you this morning. Father, I bring these fathers before you. In the name of Jesus, we commit ourselves to you. Holy Spirit, may the power of your Spirit come down into the lives of these, my brothers and my sisters. May you touch these men, Father, in a special way. May their lives, Father God, be transformed today. May your spirit come upon them in such a way that they know that they are different because you've called them to be men, real men, not sissy men. You've called them to lead no matter how difficult that it is. You've called them to love even in the face of hatred. You've caused them to bless, even in the midst of cursing. Holy Spirit, may you come upon us that we will be like you are. Not like humanity wants to mold us into becoming, but to be like you are in every way. Father, we're committed to what you say. Your words are the only words that matter. Say this after me. Father, Father in, Jesus name, in Jesus' name, I give myself to you, I give myself to you wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly to, be the to be the Father that you've called me to be. Now change me, Holy Spirit, change me, Holy Spirit. to hearing what you want me to hear, to what you want me to hear. and to acting upon what you want me to act upon. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's all give Jesus a big hand clap. Amen. You may be seated, guys. Thanks. You may be seated. Thank you.